Here on Meat Eater, we usually highlight what I like to call caveman cuisine. I'm talking about rustic backcountry dishes that really bring out the wildness and wild game. But on this episode, I want to do something totally different. I want to show you how to take some of the contents from your game freezer and turn it into an elegant Thanksgiving dinner that's going to blow your friends and family away. I'm Steven Ranella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. It's about sustenance and survival. It's about connecting to the land. It's about the purity of the challenge. It's about life. In each and every one of us, there is a primal instinct to hunt and consume. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. Folks who watch Me Eater are used to seeing me chasing game up mountains and then cooking it in the field with some awfully primitive methods. But there's another side to the story, which happens after the kill and after the meal you see on each episode. That story happens in my kitchen. In this episode of Meat Eater, I'm gonna be smoking a black bear ham from Alaska, making a minced meat pie from venison and bear lard, and a turkey galantine from a spring gobbler shot in Montana. You may not realize that a Thanksgiving cooking situation could be controversial, but this one is, because we all know that at Thanksgiving, you're supposed to cook a whole turkey in a pan so that it comes out looking just like this, but cooked. But what we're gonna do with this turkey is something that's a little more involved, it's very elegant, and it's definitely gonna be something that drives a lot of conversation around your table. And we're gonna make a turkey galantine. It's a really gorgeous dish. And if you get sick of people telling you how wild turkey is dry or wild turkey is too tough, this is what you want to throw at them. So we're gonna jump into this thing, and the first thing we want to do is skin the turkey without making any extra holes in the bird. And I'm gonna start my skinning right here on the back, and this is gonna be the only incision I make on this turkey skin is just like this. And then we're gonna skin it all the way down. You see that doing this isn't really that different than skin in any kind of animal. It's much more fragile, obviously. Like, if you're not careful, you can tear this skin. This turkey is a spring gobbler from Montana, and it's a mature gobbler. This is a great preparation for a mature gobbler, because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be grinding this meat. So there's no worry about the meat being tough. After I hunted this bird while still in the field, I plucked this bird very carefully. I always pluck my turkeys. A lot of guys skin them when they get home or skin them in the field, and I don't recommend it, because the skin is a great way to protect the bird while cooking and keep it from drying out. So here we got the turkey skin right here, and we're gonna save this because this is gonna be our sausage casing. I just wanna set this aside for now so we got a little bit of work to do before we're gonna be ready for this. The next step now is to bone this turkey out. I'm gonna start out by taking the breasts. To, to remove these breasts, I'm just cutting down the side of the breastplate, down to the breast bone, work that breast free like this. Another breast fillet. Now for the dark meat, go like this. Pop ball joint. I don't need to worry about getting it too close because I'm going to be using the bones to make turkey stock, which is going to come into play on this dish in a little while. Okay, once I bone this guy out, the final thing I want to do is just get the bones busted up because in the end, I'm going to poach the turkey galantine in stock. Once you have the turkey bones busted up in your stock pot, add your veggies. There's no need to peel them as you're just extracting the flavor. After the veggies, add a little olive oil, pop it in the oven, and wait for the bones to brown. While that's happening, our next step is to make our turkey sausage, which will serve as the filling for the galantine. There's an interesting thing to keep in mind here is like earlier I mentioned that it's a not traditional way. Like, you know, we're, we associate Thanksgiving with a whole roasted turkey. And we're kind of breaking tradition a little bit. But I want you to keep this in mind. A lot of historians suspect that they didn't actually eat turkey at the first Thanksgiving. But we do know for absolute fact is the pilgrims were eating venison at the first Thanksgiving. So to give this a real tradition shock, what we're gonna do is put some white-tailed deer in here because that's guaranteed for positive, 100% sure consumed at the first Thanksgiving. So this is gonna be a sausage mixture of dark turkey meat. Then I got pork back fat, because we're talking about really lean turkey and really lean venison. So you need to cut in a little bit of fat I got a Weston grinder, and I got a fine plate in there. You'll see this thing just hammers this meat. To our ground meat mixture, 
I'm going to add six juniper berries, a couple teaspoons of black peppercorns, thyme, allspice, cayenne pepper, cinnamon, and nutmeg. Once you have your spices in there, it's time to throw in the chopped mushrooms, pistachios, cornstarch, salt, garlic, and shallots. Also, a little brandy and some white wine. The next step now is to make our sausage casing out of the turkey skin. I'm going to cut it right along the board, would be the back. I need to lay out a piece of cheesecloth, because this is going to be wrapped up in cheesecloth. And this seems confusing, bear with me, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make perfect sense in a few moments. With that down, I'm now going to lay out the casing for the galantine. What I'm striving for here is just to have a nice rectangle with no holes. Now I want to start just putting my filling right in here. I put down about half of my mixture, flatten it out a little bit. Now we're going to add the turkey breast. I pre-diced a little over one half of one turkey breast, and we're just going to lay that on top, right in the middle of the filling. Put on a little more of the turkey sausage. Once you fully cover the turkey breast, you want to wrap the turkey skin tightly around the meat, as though you were wrapping something in foil or plastic wrap. What you're seeing here where all this comes together is going to wind up being the bottom of the dish. So when we serve it, all these seams will be hidden. It'll just be nice, clean skin on the outside. What I want to do now is just wrap this guy up in cheesecloth, and this is going to help hold the galantine together. Again, this is going to be the bottom. That's going to be the top. The final step in prepping the galantine is to bind it with kitchen string. And to do that, I need a little help. James, come in here, buddy. Can you help me with something? You sure? Yeah. Do you want to be on your stool, or you want to sit here? Sit. Okay, we know what we need to do? Yeah. We need to tie strings on here. Yeah, I need to do it. You need to do it? Yeah. That's why we got you. You holding? You need to be able to put your finger right there. You got it? Okay, okay use your finger back. Boom. Got it? Did it get you? Look good? Okay, give me five. All right. You gonna be able to help me again later? Yeah. All right. I'll let you know. I'll give you a whistle when I need you. Okay. All right, now we got the turkey bones browned up. We're gonna put them in this pot and start making our stock. We're using the skin of the turkey, the meat of the turkey, and now the bones of the turkey. So this is like nothing going to waste here. You see there's some brown stuff in the bottom of this roasting pan. So what I'm just gonna do is put a little bit of white wine in here. In cooking terms, they call this deglazing the pan. Pour that in there, put some thyme in there. A couple of bay leaves in there, a dash of salt. Okay, we're gonna put a gallon of water in here now, and then we're gonna simmer this thing for a couple hours. Basically, what you're gonna wind up with, like the base of turkey soup, take about a couple hours on stovetop before that's ready. When we come back, we brine a black bear ham and poach our galantine in what will be the finished stock. this back ham off. When I'm home, it's gonna go into the, some brine and into my smoker. This winds up coming out basically, winds up tasting like pork ham with a little bit of wildness thrown in. This is a black bear ham that I'm gonna use to make like an American style ham that would be reminiscent of just your, your common Christmas smoked ham. I say ham, but it's actually the bear's shoulder. It's a piece of meat just from here to here. The only thing it's missing is the hide, of course, and a lot of the fat. When I killed this bear, it had a lot of really good fat on it because this bear had been feeding on blueberries. I took all of that fat off and rendered it down, and that's what I have right here is sort of a homemade lard made from bear oil. The reason I wanted to take it off here is in the freezer on meat, the fat can go rancid over time. So if you're gonna store bear meat for long-term storage, you wanna clean it. You can see how stripped of fat I got it. At the time, this thing would have been that much fat on there when I first skinned this bear. So now it's much leaner. Bear meat is a little more marbled than most game meat. You can just see that there's some fat inside there. You don't see that on venison, for instance. The brine we're gonna use before smoking this ham is very, very simple. It's gonna be comprised of a gallon of water, two cups of brown sugar, a cup and a half of salt. I'm gonna pour this in, blend that up, and then brine this ham in there. You can let the ham brine at a minimum, let it go a couple days. 
At the maximum, you could really leave a ham in your fridge for 10 days and nothing's gonna happen to it. You got a lot of salt, a lot of sugar, it's not gonna deteriorate in there. A lot of brines you see where guys will just pile in tons of herbs and all kinds of other stuff into the brine, honestly, it's kind of a waste to do that. Your brine is not gonna carry that much flavor. If I was gonna do that seasoning, I'll season the meat before I cook it and just leave the brine a salt, sugar, water blend. So the next step, I wanna give this ham one last check. Make sure everything that's going in there is something I wanna eat. I trim away that little bit of fat, discolored a little bit. Looks good, no chunks of hair on there, no pieces of spruce needles or anything. And he's gonna go right in. As this thing brines and gets filled with salt and everything, it's gonna wanna float up a little bit. So I do is just take a, a plate, lay it on there, to give it a little weight, make sure there's some brine over the plate. Now, all this thing needs to do is sit in the fridge. And like I said, definitely a day or two on the far end, 10 days in the brine, you're really not gonna hurt anything. Our turkey stock has been on the stove for about two hours. Now we're gonna use that stock to poach the galantine. We're gonna strain it right into the container we're gonna use to poach the galantine. And at this point, if you're feeling hungry at all, you can come in here and pick some turkey meat. And you'll see when you make stock, you'll know you did a good job. Like when you taste the turkey meat, it's kind of drained, like it's drained of flavor, because a lot of that flavor and the marrow from the bones and various things are in your stock. So it doesn't taste quite right, and you know that you've imparted a lot of that into the cooking medium here. So now we have a big vessel full of stock. I'm gonna grab our galantine. We wanna lay this guy right in here. Perfect. And now, the key is we don't wanna boil this thing. We wanna poach this. So we're gonna Watch the temp, and I want to keep this thing at around 180 to 109 degrees. If you don't trust yourself to monitor that temperature, to be able to keep it at around 180, 190 degrees, just put a candy thermometer in there. I'm going to mount this one on the side. That way, when I put it on the double burner, I'll just be able to keep an eye on here and watch. You don't want to have rip and boil. You just want like a light simmer, and this is going to poach over a couple hours. Next up. Kapow. I can stalk it, kill it, and gut it, but can I put it into a crust? This pot has took a little bit of a turn for the worst. Fix up something to eat here, celebrate my bear kill. I'm gonna take some of this fat, I'm gonna render it down into cooking oil. For the mincemeat pie, we need a pie crust, and this is where my cooking expertise falls pretty short. I'm not a baker. I think of baking as being something more like mathematics and cooking being more like art. I did okay in art. I'm embarrassed to say I never did that great in mathematics. To make the dough for our pie crust, we add a cup and a half of flour, an eighth of a teaspoon of salt, a quarter cup of chilled milk, and eight tablespoons of lard. In this case, I'm using lard from a fall-killed black bear. Mix it together until it becomes dough. What I'm gonna do is I need to let it set for a minute and chill. Wrap it in plastic wrap. That's gonna go in the fridge for 10, 15 minutes. The base of the mincemeat pie filling is just cooked meat. And what I have here is venison rib, just cooked in the pressure cooker and pick the bones out. I need about a cup of this stuff and it's already been pressure cooked so it's very tender and I'm just gonna shred it. I know a lot of guys who just ditch their deer ribs. I don't know why. A great use form is stuff like this. It has a real texture like pulled pork. I shudder to think how many deer ribs get tossed in this country every year. It's a needless waste, man. For the mincemeat pie filling, I'm using a little more than a cup of venison. I'm cutting a little bit of pork back fat into that lean meat. We then add to that brown sugar, ground ginger, cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, and mace. After mixing that all together, I'm gonna put in some dried currants, diced apples, and raisins, along with blackstrap molasses and apple jelly. You're sort of going for the consistency of a traditional fruit pie filling. Mix that together and pour in some game stock, apple cider, and a splash of brandy. We're gonna transfer it to a pot, and then we're gonna simmer it, just to make sure everything's cooked. We wanna put this over very, very low heat. 
You don't want to burn it to the bottom. While our mincemeat pie filling is doing its thing on the stove, I'm going to head outside to get our bear ham into a Weston smoker. Okay, so there's Brian bear ham. Okay, I'm going to pat this thing dry a little bit. Squeeze some of the water out. Lay this ham. Already got some good smoke rolling. We got the ham on top. And when that drips, it's just going to collect in this liquid pan. This is going to keep moisture in there. We got the chips burning. I want to keep this guy at around 200 degrees. I can adjust it by controlling my vents, and I can adjust it by controlling my burner. So I'm just going to watch this dial. You open the door, you lose a lot of heat. And I'll just keep peeking in on it, and I'll tweak it up or down accordingly. The smoker is working its magic. So now it's time to head back inside and finish the mincemeat pie. I have no idea how to make pie crust, so I'm doing this by feel. I've watched my mom make 100 pie crusts over the years. So how hard could this be? Sprinkle a little flour, use a rolling pin. Honestly, if I didn't have bear lard, I would have just gone and bought the crust. But I like to use the bear lard, and I thought it was fitting for this meal. Yeah, it's all right. You're going to have to take back everything I said about how I don't like bacon. Whatever happens here is going to require a little patchwork. Oh, yeah, look at this, man. This is working beautifully. OK, we're going to get through this. My goal here is just to patch this together enough that after it cooks, no one would ever know that I actually lined this pan like I was working on a jigsaw puzzle. But I'm telling you, if I can do this, you can do this. But if that bear on that mountain in Alaska knew that he was going to wind up in this sweet looking mincemeat pie, he would probably have felt a lot better about what happened to him up there. And now we're going to fill the pie. And this, now that it's cooked, if you walked in the house right now, you'd think there was some kind of apple pie situation going on. Mince meat pie is a medieval dish. You know, it dates back to like 1300s in England. And some people suggest that that spice regimen they use in there was due to the fact that they were eating a lot of partially spoiled meat. And I think that if you ever do get some really ruddy meat, like a ruddy buck or javelina, or something that's got a powerful taste, and you can't quite figure out what to do with it, I think minced meat pie is a good option because you really land it to it with spices and cooking, and then you got the alcohol in there. I mean, you could put like an old dog in here, and it's probably going to taste good. In this procedure that I'm doing right now, you'll never find this suggested in a cookbook because this is not how you do this. But since I'm a neophyte baker, this is how I'm going to do it. Kapow. What happened? OK. This pie just took a little bit of a turn for the worse. Don't use my pie crust as a benchmark. See, some people might look at this crust and think that I just totally screwed it up. But what they don't realize is I'm actually making a globe. And here is um, Alaska. And this is the Aleutians coming down. And I got like Kamchatka Peninsula. Here's a little bit of the far end of Japan. Come down here is uh, Vancouver Island. It's kind of a northwesty. Lastly, you're gonna do an egg wash on here so that we get a nice golden crust. And now, over my map of the Northern Pacific, I'm gonna put a little snow in the form of coarse salt. And this is gonna go into a 400 degree oven, 45 minutes. Coming up next. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You wanna try that out? Taste it. You good? Will my guests actually enjoy the food or will they just have to pretend to like it? Okay. I ate one. It's a pleasure and an honor to share game meat with people who don't often get to enjoy it. By taking food from the forest and putting it on the table, I can be something of an experiential ambassador for the hunting lifestyle. This is what we're going to start with. This is a cold dish called a galantine. I gather that's French. That oh, looks pretty good. OK, what everybody needs to do then is take this, which is the turkey stock, the cooking liquid, and just do an application on your plate like that. Everybody yeah. rigged yeah, up? Absolutely. Oh, that's good. I have to agree. This is absolutely delicious. Yeah. This is black bear. But it smells really good. Yeah, I was going to say. Now, don't eat it till you get the mustard, because the mustard makes the dish, man. Yeah, so this bear smoked for hours. And you see, like, the red? It's kind of like a Texas barbecue thing where, the, you know, how deep the red goes. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. Yeah. Okay. But the mustard really makes it. It really does. Makes it complete, you know. Hey, Jimmy Gems, come here, buddy. Can you come here with me for a minute? What's up? <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. You want to try that out? Taste it. You good? 
Yeah, but good. I want to try this. Try that. Whoa. So this crust is made with bear lard. Who's, oh, give me your plate. Man. There you go. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and it's bear fat and deer meat. Good? <laughs> it's good though, ma'am. Yeah, what's it? It is good. So this is a bear lard crust though? Mm -hmm. It's good. Looks really good. If, yeah. if you put a blindfold on me, I might not even be able to tell that there was meat in it. You wouldn't know it was meat. I wouldn't yeah. know. You think it was some weird fruit? Yep. That is good for a convinced meat pie, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Do you need a sip of something? <laughs> He's like, there's a garden holder right there. Here, just put a squirt of water in there. <laughs> he always puts a, why do people quit drinking out of garden holes? I don't understand. <laughs> Throughout human history, the return of the successful hunter to his home has been a cause for celebration and a generosity of spirit, and a cause for thanksgiving. Our lives are obviously so different now than they were back then, some hundreds or even thousands of years ago when we fed ourselves strictly from the wild land. But a well-earned and prepared meal is still something to be honored, cherished, and respected. Each dish of wild game serves to reconnect us with the land, the animals, and the hunt. And not just those of our past, but those of our future as well. What better place to share these memories and hopes than over a meal with your family or a group of grateful friends?